Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Three Dad Bods with Brent, Carl, and Sean. We've got the two sexiest dad bods on today. Absolutely. Wow. Brent and Carl here. Good morning. How you doing, man? Pretty good, man. That was a good introduction. I like the sexy part. <laughs> Even though sometimes I don't feel Oh, it. I'm sorry. I thought you had your camera off. That's why I was I was <laughs> mentioning that. I, I apologize <laughs> to the other people. Uh, hey, you got your ratty t-shirt on, as usual, so dress up for the occasion, <laughs> will you? <laughs> anyway, it's fun. Just for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start wearing ratty t-shirts from now on just because of that now. I know. I oh. deserve that. Okay. Um. Congrats to uh, you and, and also Sean with your youngest now being graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. Tracy and I were talking about today um, that this year, this last year, it was the first year in 19 years that we haven't had a kid in school. And so it's it's a change, you know, in your in your life and stuff. But congrats on, on you guys' last ones, you know. Well, hey, thanks. Yeah, it was uh, – he's – you know, he's been looking forward to graduation for quite a while, and it was just kind of cool um, seeing him walk, you know, to get his diploma. And it was kind of weird just realizing that he's the last one as far as high school. Um, maybe he'll graduate from college. I'm not sure yet. He's still got a lot of unfinished plans that he wants to look at before he gets, you know, in these days, too. I mean, there's no reason to jump into it until you're ready. You know, I think... Right. I think sometimes we push kids to, you've got to have your career right now. And in reality, it could take some time to figure it out. And with our with the way our world is, it's made it a lot easier instead of, yeah. and I'm going to the coal mine right after I graduate. <laughs> Where's right. my lunch pail? I, I actually wish, because you figure you've spent 12 years in school. Ever since you, basically, the majority of your life in school what's the harm of taking a year off oh. from school, you know? Yeah. Because so many people, I remember when we were touring old miss with my, my oldest. And as we were there, one of the guys said something very, very interesting. I'd never thought of before, but totally makes sense. He says, 80% of all of your kids that come to school will not graduate with the major that they had gone into school with. 80%. Meaning, as you evolve, as you get into things, you realize you don't really like that direction, you're going to change, mm-hmm. you know? And so, why not take a year off, enjoy that last year of freedom before you get into this monotonous grind of having to work every day and really do a little bit of soul searching, find out who you are after these 12 years, decide, all right, this is the direction. Because you lose nothing in that year. And if anything, you gain a recognition of who you really are and what you want to do. Yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree with that. I mean, that's why, well, for LDS kids, a lot of times they just go on a mission and you know, some people go, well, that's a big deal. And it is, it's, I won't sugarcoat it. It's, it's a big commitment of time, but they can be focused on something that has nothing to do with their career. And, uh, I think, I think in a way that's, you know, the culture we live in, in Utah, the average kid after high school immediately goes on an LDS mission. A lot of them do at least. And but isn't there about a year time in between there still though? Because no. you're usually 18, 18 ish, and then you you know it's nineteen. You go on a mission, right? They sh- well, I I my kids wait a year, but um, no, actually the church changed it to eighteen. And so did they really? Yeah, yeah. It's I did not know that. Yeah, part of it was for sports, I think, for BYU, um, because these <laughs> uh, I know everything revolves around football, man. Even <laughs> even at BYU, uh, I think part of it was so they could get they still out. Get a football program there. <laughs> well, we we think we have one. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be nasty the first few games in the Big Twelve. Um, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid to watch. It'll be 
emergency going on. Well, I don't know. We'll see. They 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 think they're going to have a decent year. Um, decent to me would be six and five. But anyway, back to the subject. You darn <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> uh, yeah, they go on a mission. Then they come home, and then okay, you're supposed to integrate immediately and go back to school. You know, in other words, get into your career or go to school. And so when I was growing up, it was go on a mission, get married, and then figure out what you're going to do. Well, you're 23 by that point, you know? And, um, I mean, you know, in some of us, it takes even longer. I mean, like my son, David, he just got back from his mission a year ago and he's kind of tried, you know, he, he, he said, well, maybe I'll take some GEs at, you know, uh, BYU's extension center but he just wasn't into it. You know, he just, you know, this mm-hmm. isn't really what I want to do. And then my brother who works up as a regional uh, manager up uh, for a big major pest control company in the United States in Idaho, he had a job open down here in Utah and just, you know, I asked him about it and he said, yeah, David would be perfect for that. So David applied and now David's looking at it and like, well, dad, I could seriously, I could be a plumber or I don't have to go to college. Right. Do I? I'm like, no. You don't. And trade schools are fantastic and they will make more money yeah. than they will going to a, a university. That, I mean, that's the truth. I mean, what he wanted to do is be a teacher. So you know what? Solve that. He went as a substitute teacher at the Alpine School District for six months. And after about three weeks, he's like, this sucks. So, right. And, and then when he looked at what they got paid, I mean, it's worse than going and working at, at uh, McDonald's right now. I mean, they're paying more money to work at McDonald's because of the labor shortage than mm-hmm. what you can make as a teacher. Isn't that ridiculous? That is terrible is what that is. But let me ask you a question um, mm-hmm. because, I, you know, obviously I didn't go on a mission, but right. you went on a mission. David went on a mission. Let's say David doesn't go on a mission and he enters school, takes out loans. And for these first two years, he's racking up, you know, fifty seventy thousand dollars in in student debt and at the age when you come back off of a mission he's realizing you know after that one year of school that that's not really what he wanted to do but he would have been two years into it mm-hmm. and that much into debt and i think at that point a lot of people feel uh i gotta continue with this because i'm already this far into it yeah. so let me ask you on as, as a as a a someone who's gone through that when you went on your mission, do you feel that that do you feel that was a benefit to you in your growing up in life, in, in your identifying who you are? And so when you came back, you were more focused as an individual or is, is that just an assumption? Well, uh, I mean, I'm going to say something that's not going to be popular with a lot of LDS folks. Um, I I actually think it takes your eye off the ball, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, when when you're going to high school, and you're going to class every day. I mean, it's just like anything. If you're working out every day, you're you're in a sport, and you have to work. You know, like like my son was in in running. I mean, it's a major. You know, that's what people like. Uh, let's go back to sports analogy with football. People think BYU has got this great advantage because their guys go on this mission for two years. Well, let me tell you what you do on a mission. You go out on, you get up at six 30 in the morning. Uh, it's fairly soft. I mean, you're not, I mean, some of the guys will, will do some workout, some workouts, calisthenics, maybe, but, but really you're not going to the gym every day. Um, you're, you're not on any program. Uh, you're not competing right. really, except for pickup basketball with other people. I mean, it's, it's, it's your focus isn't there. Yeah. Your focus your, is to go yeah. out and preach the word, baby. And, right. and, and in, in that respect, there is some discipline skills you have to learn in terms of how to communicate, communicate with others. And, and I'll say that as far as a mission, especially for an introverted person, uh, it can be terrifying, but it also can be, uh, it can be very beneficial in terms of how they relate to other people. Um, and of course, you know, ultimately uh, sometimes it's not really about who you're talking to and trying to convert on your mission. It's more about 
getting a con- uh, testimony and belief in what you're talking about. Cause most guys, when they go out, I mean, they're, they're living, and we'll talk about this later, but they're living off their parents' beliefs. They haven't really developed any of their own. And so I think a mission is beneficial in that regard. And, and I, and I'll talk about it later, but I, I think it had a big effect, you know, at age 45, actually, which will be surprising than it did. It had more of an effect on me at 45 than it did when I was, you know, 19 at the time. But I'll tell you, when I got home from my mission, though, I mean, dude, mm-hmm. I was way behind the eight ball in my in my feelings. A couple of the facts were I was, you know, I wasn't in that groove of going to school every day. Um, and, you know, I went to college right before I left on my mission. So when I came back, I thought, well, I'll, I'll get back into it, but you don't have any money. You're, you know, you have to get right. a car. Um, and then the focus at that time, they're not as, it's not as bad now. But when I got out of my mission, my mission president said to me right when I was leaving the day before, your number one priority is find an internal mate. And I was one of the more rebellious types. And I'm Crazy. like, screw that. I'm going to wait a while. <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, and play the field right when i got back and so um and you know so i mean it, things are a little disjointed would be a good way to put it and so yeah. i guess it could have been too maybe my mom and dad could have focused more on pushing me into school um when i got back but at that point we didn't have the money and um you know i couldn't just for at that point there were some other reasons i couldn't just get a student uh student loan and so anyway i uh i worked for a while afterwards and then um moved down to provo went to school for a little bit uh still didn't know what i wanted to do and then ended up getting married and then uh and then all of a sudden you start having to really cramp down and say okay i got to figure something out yeah <laughs> right so yeah. anyway, so, yeah. Was I, there, was there a, a have, have things changed from when you went on your mission to when David went on his mission, as far as the things that you do inside the mission, oh. obviously the technology has changed a lot, mm-hmm. but it, were, was his mission schedule different than what yours was? Well, he, he kind of had, okay. So he, his first day. Because so most missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, this is what we're talking about right now. If if you're not aware, um, they go to what's called the Missionary Training Center. It's a big building in Provo. Uh, it's been remodeled a few times, but it, it's like a campus, kind of like a high school camp or college campus. And you you go there for three weeks to two months, and you either learn a foreign language, and you kind of learn the day to day routine, and also uh, kind of the teaching format. I, I, <laughs> I used to laugh and call it the sales training program on how to talk about your beliefs. Uh, cause most of these guys, I mean, they have no clue on how to even right. communicate, you know, let alone, um, now you're going to go out and you have to talk to adults and you have to be able to sound like you're halfway competent and understand you know, and then share your beliefs with other people. It's, it's not, it's not something that anybody just can do. And so anyway, so you go to this MTC and then, then they throw you on a plane. I mean, I had, I was there three weeks and then, uh, terrible food. And, uh, but they, they fill you up with a lot of, you know, gung ho. It's like, it's really a lot of like sales conference you go to for three weeks, you know? Um, so, and then, on the plane you go, you get out there, and of course, it's not even close to the reality that you were expecting. And I remember the first day I got out there, we are, I don't know where we are. We're somewhere in South Jersey. I'm in a car with three other dudes that have been there a little bit, of course. I've got my yeah. trainer. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, this car of four girls pulls up. You'll respect this story a lot. And then they look over at us and they go, hey, you guys are the effing Mormons. <laughs> and and we're kind of like, you know, and the other three guys are laughing and I'm like, what's happened? What's going to happen next? And all of a sudden all four girls, 
<laughs> this, is, this is like five o'clock at night on a major road and all four girls are flashing me and i think and they all look at me and they say welcome to jersey dude so <laughs> and and i remember that night i'm sitting there laying in my bed we didn't have a cell phone uh there, there was just the mission phone i mean i'm 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 in this room all alone with this dude. I have no idea who the hell he is. <laughs> His name was Kelly, uh, Kelly yeah. Alvord, cool guy. But but at that time, I I, I met him one time actually. I'd kind of I I'd actually played football with him with some other guys behind my house that where we lived in West Valley and the Corys. I don't know if you knew Jason Corey, but uh, yeah. yeah, Fifth Ward. Yeah. Anyway, uh, his his it's his uncle, and so. Uh, we'd played football a few times, but that's it. Just pick up football. But, you know, he was kind of those introverts. He didn't like to talk. And so, and, mm-hmm. and I, I think he wasn't excited about having me as the newbie, you know? And so uh, I kind of felt like real, real isolated, very alone. And that night I was thinking, okay, how the heck do I get to the airport? You know, I know my phone number at home. My dad would probably pay for a ticket back, but how the hell do I get out of here? <laughs> and so... You know, so yeah. that that feeling follows you for about a month or two. Every once in a while, you'll get that. Maybe I want to get go home, but so, yeah. So to recap, and and those of you who have kids out there, imagine your eighteen to nineteen year old son huh. <laughs> leaving your house, and and look, let's be honest, Utah is a different environment than most areas, other mm-hmm. areas. So. 18, 19 year old son who's been with his parents his whole entire life suddenly shipped off to South Jersey, <laughs> Philadelphia. Yep. Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Now, and everybody knows stories and, and hears things that happens in Philadelphia. So imagine being 18 and 19 years old and now you're in Philadelphia. If you ever watch complete them. different environment, your first night, not really knowing, you don't, your closest person you know is 2,500 miles away from you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And well, that's just Philly. I, I like imagine going to like Singapore or Brazil oh, or. I couldn't what, even imagine. Yeah, that, that's a lot. Yeah. That is a lot to put on uh, 18 an 18 old. and 19 year old yeah. child. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, at nineteen, let's say nineteen. Uh, well, yeah, well, let me tell you what the average day is like, and it's not too bad. I mean, you get up at six thirty, which, well, as an old man, it's easy to get up at six thirty. But when I was younger, it was a little more difficult. But, um, but you know, you you get up and you know you have to do some studying with with the guy you're assigned with to cover that particular area that you're assigned to. And then about 9.30, you roll out on some bicycles. And in the East Coast, as you know, it's it's humid in the summer. And that's humid. when I got out there, right Very in the middle humid. of July. And mm. uh, all was, that was a shock. And then, you know, you go, you drive, yeah. you ride your bike for those two. Sites, What's that? Those sites of people busting water hydrants open and stuff, you, you, I'm sure you saw oh, that yeah. a lot there, didn't you? I, I was jealous. Yeah. I wanted to jump in. Yeah. It was so bad. But Yeah, you, you do that because it's so incredibly hot. <laughs> well, I, I would drive like two or three miles on my bike and not feel it. And then as soon as you got off the bike, all of a sudden you yeah. felt like you're dr- <laughs> drenched. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. You could be inside drinking a glass of water with whoever you're trying to talk to. And they're looking at you like, don't sweat on my couch. And I'm like, I'm trying not, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm trying not to, as it just coats everything. So, um, and as someone from a dry climate, you're definitely not you ready for it. And so right. it, it takes a while to get used to it. But I mean, other than that, it was, you know, I mean, they get treated pretty well. I mean, as a, a missionary for your church, uh, there is a built-in respect factor that the membership looks at you at a little different level. And and I think I think it may be done on purpose as part of the design. Um, I mean, you certainly didn't earn that respect, really. Um, some of the guys that go out are yahoos, I mean, and they continue to be yahoos. Um, um, there's some disgusting stories I've heard. And then there's some really awesome stories I've heard. I mean, I, I was part of both too. You know, I had a companion that was a Yahoo. And then I also had some 
uh, companions, the guy you're assigned to, uh, people that, um, you know, I really respect even to this day. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, he died a few years ago, but, um, you know, you develop some relationships that follow through the years after you get home. So it's, it, it's an, it's an amazing experience. I, I won't discount that. I just, I just, when you get back though, you know, you've been focused completely on this for two years and, and then all of a sudden you're. So did David's schedule follow the same? Well, that's what I was going to go to. So David got COVID hit. And so. Oh, that's right. The yeah. week the MTC it's was totally closed was the week he was supposed to. <laughs> yeah. So what, what he was called to uh, Reno, Nevada, Spanish speaking. And it was his call. It was his call. He wasn't called anywhere else. So he was supposed to fly to Mexico City for th- for his two months training because they feel. Really? Yeah, it was weird. Um, they didn't do that before. So I think uh-huh. maybe the church feels like if you have to be immersed completely in the Spanish culture, you'll learn the language faster. I mean, that wow. makes sense. Yeah. Look, I've been to Mexico City as an adult. I was 36, 37 the first time that I went to Mexico City. It is overwhelming. It's, it it is, yeah. it is a complete different environment. I mean, and, and, Wow. I I can't imagine being 18 and and that's being shipped off to Mexico City. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's a real deal. That's a scary place. Well, you you know why I didn't go Spanish speaking. I got to tell the story. So because you hate tacos. No. Well, I love tacos, man. (laughs) I love it. I love a little heat south of the border, man. So anyway, uh, (laughs) like some like some chilies. Give me some chili, baby. Anyway, uh, so. My dad and mom, I was the oldest, so they were paranoid because a couple missionaries down in somewhere in Bolivia or Chile got shot and killed um, about mm-hmm. a month or two before I left. I don't know if you remember that in the news, but I do. Uh, so they went into our bishop at the time, Lunt and uh, Brother Lunt, and and they told him, uh, "Well, we won't let him go if he gets called to." You know. If he gets called to South America, we're going to nix it. <laughs> and so I you couldn't do that. Well, supposedly, I mean, the belief is that the prophet sits down and every calling is thrown out there and it's like inspired, right? They, there's, yeah. you know, God sends down where you're going to go and then you go, right? It doesn't quite happen that way. Going there. Yeah, there's a little more practicality and, yeah, you know, there's there's some logistics, you know? And so, you know, if this mission's losing 15 missionaries now I have heard though, this is, this is something I, I, I can't verify, but I've heard it from multiple people that even to this day, that there is a member of the 12 apostles that they call, these are the men that are called to kind of lead the church along with the prophet of the church or president of the church. Anyway, there is a apostle that is designated to be in charge of that department and then sit down once a week, or I don't know what it is exactly timeline, but to sit down and say a prayer before the computer chunks out where everybody's going. So it's not romantic. (laughs) You know, I got a, well, I got a, I got a signature from Ezra Taft Benson, but at the time he wasn't doing many signatures. He was kind of on the last leg. Right. And uh, it was a, it was a stamp. I mean, you could tell. So um, so it, it's changed a lot from the Joseph Smith years in the 1800s to now. So anyway, so David got his calling to Reno, Nevada, Spanish speaking. And so then COVID hit and we even wondered if he was going to go. And, uh, so they, the church called at last minute and said, you will be part of that first MTC at home group. So he spent three weeks studying here at our house, my house. And so he'd come up at night. So he'd be on all day, uh, basically mm-hmm. zooming. And then, um, and then about five thirty, he was done and then it was weird. He could watch TV with us if he wanted. So I don't, I, you know, of course I had to play, uh, um, American pie, you know, to make sure he, he wasn't too crazy. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't, I did. I didn't do that, mom. I didn't seriously. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, uh, but he'd hang out with the family for a while, then go back to bed and make sure he's in, he still had to follow the mission rules. They have a, 
set of rules. They have to be up at a certain time and in bed at a certain time. And, you know, how many jumping jacks you can do at a certain time. I'm just kidding on the jumping jacks, but it is a little regimented and it's probably a good thing for these guys, these age, cause they're not used to regimen at, at all. Right. And so anyway, he did that for only though, in his case, three or four weeks. And usually they're supposed to be in, uh, learning the language for two months. So he didn't really learn the language before he went out. Then he got sent downtown Reno, his first area. And I don't know if you've been in Reno, but um, have. yeah, by the casinos, I think is where his area was. Anyway, uh, it was urban. And he sat in an apartment for basically six months because the governor of the state of Nevada, of course, wanted everybody to stay in their apartment. So um, yep. the Good church lead. follows the rules. Yeah. And so... Um, so what they did is they had to adjust. And so they did a lot of social media contacting through Facebook. Um, it was kind of creative, actually. But he did more drawing and playing games with his companion mm-hmm. than actual missionary work. But then once things began to loosen up, um, that's when things got a little more normal for him. And he started doing a lot of things that uh, not necessarily what we did because it was low tech when we were out. But. Uh, one of the real strange things is we would have a weekly call with him where we would do a zoom. Um, they didn't let you do that back in my day. It was, you get two let you get a, you have to send a Your letter. Letters. Yeah. Once yeah. a week, uh, no emails. There weren't any emails anyway. Right. Um, right. no phone calls. Um, you only talked to her on mother's day and you talked on Christmas. That was it. Two calls a year. And yeah, it was, it was, it was a little more Spartan would be a good way to put it. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of have mixed feelings on that. What, what was happening though, a few years before David left is a lot of people were coming home early due to psychological issues, uh, emotional issues. Mm. I mean, this generation, mm. and I don't want to beat up on them, but they're a little softer when it comes to emotional issues. I mean, back in our day, it was, you know, get off the ground, put some dirt on it, move on, you know? Right. Depression wasn't even a thing that you really talked about, right? I mean, did you ever talk right. about depression when you were a kid? No. No, no we, it, we didn't. And, and that was kind of a, a new thing that came around. But, I mean, you know, it's it's the advent of screens yeah, that yeah. has made, well, we had these, made depression source. We had this one weird guy on our mission and he got sent to the mission home. And at that time I was at the mission home because I was the commissarian. So my job was to kind of be a store manager for all the other missionaries in the mission. And so they'd call in their Bible orders or whatever they needed. And then at the zone conference, I'd deliver those. Right. Well, Mm -hmm. um, there was this guy, he got sent in. I won't say his name anyway, just reminding myself not to use his name. Anyway, he's a weird duck. Um, kind of one of those social recluse kite in the guys that, I mean, he could be the guy you see with the machine gun killing everybody, you know, that kind of yeah. guy. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, later in life and, and, uh, he had some issues and I was like, how the heck did he get out here? And, and right. so they had sent him a lot of us pressure though, too, you know? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, because cause I remember being 19 years old, I I didn't have a desire to go on to a mission. There were other things I was doing in my life. I didn't feel like I was, quote unquote, worthy to go on one. Right. You know, and, and so I shouldn't be out there. But I remember the immense pressure from family members, from people in the church. You have to go. You got to what, what do you mean you're not going to go? It's you're you have to go. And I was like, wow, no, yeah. like I, I would be. um I, I would not be a good missionary out there because of the way I'm living my life at that point. And there were other people that were living their life the exact same way that I was. And they were going out there in missions. And I always thought that's very hypocritical. You well, know, I, I can't go out there, you know, preach, chastise, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex. And then here's all these people. I, I went to a kegger for a missionary before he went on his mission. Oh, well, Does that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> things have changed a lot. They're a lot more strict about what these kids can have been involved in sin wise before they leave. But I mean, I, yeah, I agree with you when I, when, when we left, there was, 
30,000 missionaries out there, new missionaries almost every month or some crazy number. And it was such a big deal that every, you know, if you didn't go the incredible negative pressure of what kind of person you were, yeah, you know, you wouldn't get a date when you get home. Um, I know my parents were kind of cool about it. You remember my dad was the rebel, right? And so he actually, it was right during that period of time where he was kind of having one of those midlife faith crises. That would be a good way to put it. Is, I, that's what I, yeah. Right? <laughs> well, and he told me, he's like, we've been he, there. <laughs> he said, I don't know if this is a good idea for you. I said, why do you, what do you mean? He says, well, I know how you are. And he said, I just think you're going to struggle because uh, you're going to not want to do what the man tells you. And I'm like, uh, okay. And he said, you're really going to have to bite your upper lip or bottom lip, whatever lip you want to bite, because you're going to have to bite it a lot. And he was right. He was right. right. And, right. Um, you know, there were some things that I was asked to do that I really didn't want to do. I didn't want to do it their way. And, and, and it, it kind of went against kind of my cycle, you know, just the way I am. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to go and that was the right. key. Now, there are a lot of guys that were promised, like uh, Suzu Trooper, one guy that I went with, um, that I trained. Um, you know, anytime we walked past a house that had pot, the dude's face would get dreamy, you know? And I'd be like, come on, man, let's let's stay focused. So did, so. did any missionaries lose their faith out there as, as they were going through these lessons and stuff and... Maybe some of them, some of them had something click in their head, like, "Oh, wait, wait a minute," you know. Mm -hmm. Did that ever happen? Yeah, yeah, a number of times. Um, I mean, you aren't okay. Well, this is again something that you know some people might not like me talking about, but uh, especially back then. Nowadays, it's a. I think these kids are getting a lot more information off the internet, so it's not as hidden. But back in our day, there was no internet. You you, you right. couldn't find out about the four different versions of the first vision or you, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is LDS history that Box. I call the sanitized version that we got. Yeah. Um, and you're not ready for it. So you, I went into a Christian bookstore and I'm just, you know, kind of young, new at this, my first area. Walk in, looking around, I'm like, oh, there's a whole section on Mormons. <laughs> and I was like scratching my head going, what's this about? So I started reading The God Makers. And then, uh, and then it was, uh, you know, Joseph Smith and his many wives and Brigham and his many wives. And I was just like, well, I knew about that. That, that I did know. But, I, you know, so I, I was like, so I went to the, to the store owner or the, the clerk. It was a little female. And I said, hey, why don't you have like a Book of Mormon or Jesus the Christ? That's a great book. Um, why don't you have something like that? And my companion's just keeping his mouth shut. He's like, he's the rookie. Let him be a, let him, let him earn his stripes here. So then I turned around to talk to my, to talk to Kelly, my, uh, the guy with me, the, my trainer. And so I, uh, as I turned around, she slips out into the back and this big burly dude with a big old bushy beard is now leaning at the table, looking at me, Hey, sonny. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, Hey, so I do the whole routine. And he's like, yeah. I mean, he starts going off. I mean, off saying stuff that I'd never heard before. And, uh, yeah. you know, luckily my dad was kind of in the polygamy thing. So I'd already known a little bit about that, but I can imagine some dude that never had heard anything about it coming out and getting blasted by that. And so, yeah, there were a few guys that, you know, started, started watching, I, you know, there's a guy that Richard Dusher, um, he did the uh, God's army movie and yeah, God's yeah, army yeah. two. And that, that God's army two is a good movie in terms of a guy that's struggling a little bit with what he believes and how he tries to figure it out. And so, I mean, it's pretty accurate, actually. I was a little surprised when I watched the movie myself. Um, and, uh, yeah. You know, I, um, so I'll tell you a mission story here. 
Um, cause it, you reminded me being rookie and stuff like that. But, um, mm-hmm. I, there were, there were some missionaries that, that came to our door and, and first of all, I'm never negative. I actually enjoy having them come cause I like to talk to them, see where they're from, you know, um, share what they're doing and stuff like that. And so, um, I remember he came to the door and, and it was very hot, you know? Oh, hey, and, we have um, a surprise guest. Hold on, Glenn, hold on. Uh, <laughs> hey, 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 Sean. Hey, Glenn. How are you hey. guys doing? Just Morning, loving. guys. How are you feeling? Well, I feel feeling feel good. Okay. Are you at the? You're not. You're at home or at the hospital right now? No, I'm still stuck in the hospital. They won't let you out. Oh, not yet. Okay. What's what's the, just what, go? Just run. Run, yeah. Glenn. I'll, I'll create a distraction, <laughs> all right? Let, the problem is they'll let you run. They'll just send you the bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they might send you the bill, huh? So so tell us, what's this? when are you going to be out? Um, or do you know yet? I'm hoping today, but maybe tomorrow. Okay. We'll see. You don't sound okay. bad. Well, so. thanks, sweetheart. <laughs> you look terrible, though. Man. Yeah, I wouldn't want to. You always look terrible. I wouldn't want to wake up next year, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> anyway. That's been a problem for 53 years. What's this? <laughs> that guy, man. I'm kind of that guy. I, I, think, did, did, I think Sean what is Santa looks Santa doing. I yeah, think what was Santa? I was going to say, Glenn, you're sexier than Sean. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's he saying? He said, I'm sex. You're sexier than me. Yeah, I don't know about yeah. that. I wonder why Santa's visiting you and May. That is so odd. <laughs> yeah, he looks like Santa Claus. It's an illusion. Yeah. yeah. I like his. I like Sean's new Facebook picture, the one with the the mountain man beard. It looked kind of cool. Very, very bountyish, like yeah. the towels. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, so you haven't been on the bike yet, then, huh, Glenn? So no, you know, I'm they, still stuck here. I'm hoping, hoping tomorrow morning I'll be. If I can get out of here today, I'll be riding tomorrow. You so, feeling a lot good. better? Um, I feel pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. How how's no, the how are the how are your blood levels? He doesn't feel good at all. <laughs> what did you say? What, what did you ask? What are your blood levels on the on the white blood cell? Is it getting better where you need them to be so you can yeah, get the actually, treatment? Yeah. Uh, yesterday is a big progress day for me. Got awesome. uh, got some platelets down or up, and I got some bilirubin down, and I got some white blood counts up a bit. So that's good. That's so uh, Lake Powell. Here we come, right? Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> it's filling up, man. Yeah. You're going to have some water there this year. So. Yep. All right. See, Lone Rock has almost got water around it, so that's good. Oh, that's cool, man. Well, I'm glad you're doing better. Thank goodness. I was a little stressed last week when I saw that post. Yeah. Especially yeah, about... it's, uh, anytime they drain 2.8 liters out of your right lung area. That's, that, that's, uh, a, that's a lot, man. Was it? Was it yellow? Yeah, yeah, it's all yellow. Oh, okay. It was nasty. Okay. Yep. That was did you smell it? No. Good. What no. is what is wrong with you? <laughs> Jeez. Don't you smell yeah. every mix some don't, mix don't some seven like, up in there, have a little don't, swig. Don't you like <laughs> Sean, don't you ever like uh put your finger in your ear and smell it, make sure you're okay? What is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's articles on Google about that. What kind of retard well, do we if have? It's smelly. If it, it doesn't smell <laughs> <All right. decent. laughs> We're not putting this in the God, podcast. this is this has gone the wrong direction quickly. <laughs> Carl, where else do you put your appendages and smell it? That's weird. <laughs> well, they say your poop needs to smell decent. I don't put my nose in it, but I mean, you know, what? you can look at it. You ha- don't it, you look man, at this your went poop in the toilet bowl? Fast. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to apologize for my friends that are actually part of this podcast. Yeah, and first of all, you know, they have to listen that, that volunteer themselves to listen to this three hours or maybe these three D But and, and they're not normal. And now we know I that think, Carl doesn't do the courtesy all plus. They are all not normal in the head, but to some degree. Oh, oh my goodness. Doesn't it bug you at public restrooms, especially when you're working? <laughs> And the douchebag before you walk into the room, you mean you didn't flush? I flush. Uh-huh. Don't you flush every time? Yeah. I flush, but Look, apparently not. I flush as I'm going. Courtesy flushes stuff. are oh. have to be done. I don't even want the person in the room with me at the same time. 
I mean, everybody in the men's bathroom, no one says anything. And then I, you know, you don't even want to fart. So you kind of, it's kind of like a, a fan. It's like a ninja poop, you know, you kind of gently squeeze it out. And then, and then all of a sudden you go. I surely so hope we were having a spiritual conversation before all this went down. We were. We're right in the middle yeah. of, we're talking about missionary work, oh, yeah. Yeah. and then here we are now. Here we are. <laughs> we're talking about the honest truth. Yeah, That is the honest truth, man. <laughs> we just wanted to make you laugh, <laughs> Glenn. <laughs> we're all bearing testimony of Christ, and then Carl all of a sudden, yes. Carl starts talking about poopy and so flushing out the toilet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly yeah, what happened. That's exactly that's pretty what much we it do. right there. That's 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 this podcast. It's just a pile of poop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's flush uh, this sniff and poop. <laughs> anyway, yeah. dude, I'm glad you're feeling better. So yeah. good to see uh, you. Man. It'll be good, good to see you. It'll be good. Get out of here. All right, man. Later. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. You're a weirdo. <laughs> i think we're gonna keep some of that for an outtake anyway okay yeah. back to okay right. let's so, start back so back to my story yeah so so missionaries come to the door and you know it, it, it's hot and i'm like hey guys you know uh you guys want something to drink you know, want some water i got some lemonade back here and they're like oh yeah man it's really hot it's like you know i bring it out to them and, and uh all of a sudden, the one kid starts right in with his spiel. And, and I go, hold up, hold up, look. Y'all can come here, and it's hot, and get something to drink and all that. The only thing that I ask is that we don't talk about religion. And the, the kid starts in with, well, well, you know, why not? You know, I have a strong... T-. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. Look, I'm, I'm just telling you, like, I'm more than cordial. We'll sit, we'll talk. Talk about where you're from, you know, talk about things that are going on. I'll, I'll help you guys out if you ever need help. I just don't want to talk religion with you. And he's like, well, why not? You know, because, you know, it's, we, we have a wonderful religion. You know, we, we, there's a great man named Joseph Smith. I'm like, just stop. I used to be a Mormon, right? And, and I know all about the church. Mm-hmm. I know things you don't know about the church. And I know, I know what you're going to say. I know how I'm going to respond, and I know how you are going to respond to that. I know how it's going to go. I know what what your pattern is. And here's the thing, is that I'm going to say something to you, and right now it's not going to resonate. But a few years down the line, it's going to resonate in your head, and it's going to change how you feel about things. And I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be that person. And his his companion was like, thank you, sir. We're going to go now. And, and you know, I, I mean, I felt bad, but I didn't want to get into that shuffle of what you're taught to. Really, I don't mind talking to you at all, man. Let's 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 talk about where you're from. You know, hey, you're from West Jordan. Wow. You know what you got going on there. But like, I'm not going to get into that discussion with you because I know too much that's going to affect the way that you feel. And I don't, I honestly never want to do that to anybody at all. I don't want to be that person. Well, and I think, I think part of the thing is you've noticed that the church does not send out 40 to 50 year old guys anymore. Like they did in the early time of the, of the church history. They can't. And well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, raising a family um, career, that kind of thing's a lot different than it was back then. But I mean, it was, just, it was even worse sacrifice probably too back then. Cause you know, who's going to put, put the seed in the ground for the next year's harvest. If taking the dude's out. wife while he's gone. Sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's <smart ass. laughs> anyway, uh, we won't go there yet. We can edit that one. Uh, we'll edit. Uh, but as far as, uh, but no, I mean, but these days, I mean, I mean, I can imagine some mission president trying to tell me what I can or can't do at this age. I mean, I'd be like, eh, screw you. I'll do what I yeah. want, you know? So right. people are a little more uh, impressionable at that age. I think, uh, you know, p- these younger people will follow program better. Um, but there's a serious lack of knowledge there, like you're saying. And I mean, you know, as far as the, what the mission taught me or, or, you know, I think that was what you originally asked. Um, I think it just, it, it, it's, it's one of those experiences that most people don't have. And um, I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know if we have enough time to go through 
the whole nuance. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of go through uh, what happened with me. So I got, okay, let's go after the mission. Let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Um, so I'm, I get married and start having children and doing everything a good Mormon boy does, you know, and that's going to church every Sunday, raising your kid, you know, and that, that's all the ultimate thing, raising your family and serving in the church and building the next generation. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was 2000, oh, to oh, seven, oh, eight time, time period. And I was, I was kind of bored. You know, I'd go every every Sunday, and because it's it's difficult when you're trying to sanitize history, you really can't have too many uh, lessons that are different from one another. You know, and and one thing at that time, at least, the church had not focused as much on, um, I guess, New Testament, Old Testament. It was mostly Book of Mormon doctrine and covenants. These are scriptures within the LDS Church, and uh, church history, and you only hear one version of the church history. You didn't. You really didn't hear some of the more controversial stuff. And so, I read a couple books. You know, uh, one was called Rough Stone Rolling, and another one was called Sacred Loneliness. And then I started doing some research online. And of course, there's fundamental preachers, Baptist preachers. Yeah, there's some anti-Mormon. They think we're a cult and. I mean, maybe they have a few things that they might be right about that in regards to LDS belief, but or how people are. But if, for the most part, they're wrong too. And um, and I think there's a major agenda as far as what LDS people call the anti-Mormon um, people out there. However, there are some things that are they're accurate that they bring out about right. the church. And so, right. anyway, I. I, you know, on my mission, I really didn't look at it. I kind of ignored it like I was told to. And just, you know, you kind of just kind of put blinders on, you know, and and, and then once you get back in the real life, you know, you've got all kinds of other things that keep you busy. So you're not really worried about it. But at that point, I was kind of bored. I, I, I hated going to Sunday school and priesthood and sacrament meeting. It was I'd rather go for a drive. And so um, I found this stuff online, started reading it kind of kind of hit a little bit kind of made me a little what else are we hiding here and so made you think yeah made me think and it was okay you know i i at that point i I wasn't quite over the edge yet but um and then at that point you know a, a few more years went by and um i just you know kind of decided that hey i want to explore some other options and um so my ex and I talked about it and I was a little worried because in the LDS faith, a lot of divorces occur because one person stops believing the other one continues to believe unlike your parents. And so I was a little worried that would happen, but she, poof, she's like, okay, let's stop going. I'm like, wow. Okay. And so we stopped going. And, uh, and by the way, uh, I've never understood that mentality. What's up? If you are a husband, I've, I've never understood that mentality of, I, if you're a husband and wife and you love each other, you don't love each other because of religion. You yeah. love each other because of who you are. Right. And so I've never understood like, oh, well, he's no longer part of, of my faith. So uh, you're going to have to leave. Well, I, I, you're well, going to throw away 25 years of marriage because I've suddenly realized who I am. I think it's part like, of the I, construct I, that LDS people create when they get meet each other. It's the whole family eternal family construct so you're kind of breaking that by telling her i don't believe this anymore i i, I want to explore some other options and i think and you, you then realize that there's not three kingdoms that there's one place and you can all live together and hang together the same way so. or maybe there's no place <laughs> maybe you just take a dirt nap you know let's don't go into that path I don't yeah want to. no i know i know but i'm just saying <laughs> I, well, I look, look, LDS, LDS, part, there's some wonderful things with the LDS culture, beautiful things. And then there's some things that create some real issues later on if, if you start having some second, you know, doubts. And that one of, so here's the problem. A lot of guys that leave the church, a lot of people leave the church, go atheist, just stop believing yeah. in anything. And it's actually pretty common. And it's, it's which be- is understandable too. 
Well, know, yeah, because you, you your whole life you've been taught this and, and this yeah. and that, and suddenly, oh, that that way that can't be right, and that can't be right. So all of it must be false. And well, yeah, it, yeah. If you're going to yeah, second guess the the first vision, why aren't you second guessing the Bible and the New Testament? I mean, right. I mean, and we're not going to get into it, but man, dude, I, I was a history major, and I could rip apart the Catholic Church, and I could rip apart Protestantism. I mean, it's. Yeah. And then the church, LDS church, does a good job of making everybody sound like they're they're following, you know, they're they're going the wrong direction. And of course, you know what's funny now, years later, looking at what's going on in our country and seeing what secular secularism is doing to our country, um, we all should be big on the same side. Illness. Yeah, we all should big be on the same. Illness. Yeah, we yeah. should be on the same side right now, especially with this whole some of these, you know, what's coming up this next month. And anyway, right. so, um, uh, so Back anyways, to your story. yeah. So at that point, she and I decided to, you know, explore. And so we went to an evangelical church. I couldn't, I just didn't dig the whole Trinity thing. <laughs> you know, it was like, eh, right. And no one could explain it. And even the preacher, I mean, I, I cornered him on it and I said, Tr- just logically explain how God could be three and the same and blah, blah, blah. When he's praying, when Jesus is praying to God and the Holy spirit comes down and there's three, they're all separate. And he's just like, well, it's one of those mysteries. I'm like, that's no better than Mormonism teaches us. And then you sitting here trying to be the alternative to LDS. And that's what he kind of, kind of did. He created this church that would attract ex Mormons. Right. And so, you know, I like the coffee and I, I like the band. It's got cooler music than the LDS church, but I just don't, I don't dig it. Right. You know, I just, I, I can't, I, 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 I can't agree with the, the philosophy here. And so we stopped going and, and then we, we did some other crazy stuff we won't get into on this podcast. And it ended up taking me further and further away from my religious roots. And during this whole time though, and this is about a period of a three years and, I, you know, I had my Sundays off. I, I'd go swimming on Sundays. We, I mean, I had a blast. I mean, in U- Utah County, the best time to go to a movie, my friend, is <laughs> Sunday afternoon. No one's sitting in there with you. You got the whole theater to yourself. You don't worry about popcorn. You got, I mean, it's awesome. Uh, the store, you can run in and run out. You know, it's it's oh, just so funny. freaking awesome. You want to go to oh, the, the Jello curtain? Mm. Yeah, you want to go up in the mountains and go see nature. You don't have five thousand other people around you. I mean, oh, man, Sunday. Hey, if, if you're not Mormon, <laughs> Utah's a place on Sundays, man. Yeah. So anyway, um, so there came a certain point though, where uh, I got kind of sidetracked. So did my ex. Uh, and to the point where I personally felt it was affecting my family and me, you know, and I kind of still had this, I can't talk for her, but I had this emptiness that I was still feeling having Mm -hmm. left the church and there was a hole there and I hadn't filled it with anything else other than, well, I mean, just, you know, heathen activity. I'll, I'll put it that way. And it wasn't, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't, filling that it wasn't hole what you needed no no in fact yeah. my life was chaotic and not only uh religiously but also uh physically and financially i mean everything was going downhill yeah you know i told you the story privately um yeah. Yeah. and then i had a awake awakening i guess would be a good way to put it i was at the park with my three my boys my four boys um So it was Tyler, David, Eric, and Ryan. And we were playing football. There's just a little park down the street from where I live right now. And it was a nice sunny morning in the middle of May. And, uh, you know, my oldest son, he just, dad, I just, I've, you know, sometimes I feel like you and mom are so distracted with the things that you do with such and such and so and so that you guys just don't care about us as much anymore. And, oh, Man, it's hard when it comes from your kids. Oh, wow. dude, that was like a, it was like an arrow in the heart, man. And, and slap in the face. And I knew it. I knew it. 
I, I yeah. knew deep down something was wrong. And and there were some other things going on with that other thing I was doing that was was quickly going to cause a change anyway. So I uh, I said, well, what do you want to do about it? And he says, well, I want to go back to church, LDS church. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, uh, okay. And uh, I said, okay, I'll support you. You know, I, he had a girl he was trying, interested in in junior right. high, and yeah. You know. And and in Utah, it's it's a large part of an acceptance and in a community. I I, yeah. I totally understand that. And the scouts at that time, before they went, kind of weird. Um, the yeah. LDS Church was big time in the scouting program, right? And and it was a right. good influence on young men. And so uh, all my boys were in it. And so um, and that's how the w- local congregation stayed in touch with me even though i didn't want to have anything to do with them um they they stayed in in touch with me through my boys and the scouting program so i went to church the next sunday it'd been a long 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 time i thought the freaking walls would break down when i walked through the door you know and it was the same <laughs> it was the same from when we went to church you know in terms of the feel and yeah. uh the bishop spotted me immediately cornered me uh i was like oh great here we go and he's like i need to talk to you I'm like uh okay and i was at the point where i was like oh what, what, what will it hurt i'll listen to what he says and so we sat down and you know he didn't really know i, I you know i kind of told him a little bit about my story but didn't really get any details yet and uh there were some other people in the area that kind of knew me too that i'd known from a different out in south jordan and so he, they kind of had a little bit of the story, but they didn't know everything. And um, so we talked for a little bit. I told him that my marriage was falling apart and, you know, that my sons needed this. And so uh, he says, well, I need you to come every week. And I said, you shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> so he did see me for <laughs> another year. <laughs> so anyway, I, that's how I've always advised people since I've gone back to church do not ask me or don't tell me what I should do. I'll do what I want to do. But anyway, right. So, uh, but then, you know, things continue to get worse with the marriage, you know, divorce was coming. Um, and my, I just noticed that my boys kept, get, you know, you know, be guy by going to church and I continued to drive them to church. I just listened to podcasts out in the parking lot and then they'd come out and then we'd drive back home. And so, um, and I'd ask him how things went. They'd tell me, Hey, it was great. And, I just noticed the the atmosphere, and plus my ex had moved out, and I just noticed the atmosphere in the home was getting better and better because, of course, we weren't fighting anymore. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I part, I think most of it was that. But uh, then, you know, I one day I just decided to go back in, and and I'd been thinking about it a lot because my world was a mess, and I just knew deep down that. Um, I mean, is Mormonism the answer? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, right now, it's the answer. It's it's right. what I need, too. And so, I mean, because I remember all the things we were taught. And and it's not that far off of mainline Christianity as far as, you know, not having sex before yeah. marriage. And, you know, just respecting your body and not drinking and, you know, getting into drugs. And I mean, just the good fundamental message that everybody needs to hear, Right. And, and, and so I went, so I went back and, um, was humble and sat down with the Bishop again. And then he got a box of Kleenex out. And for the next hour and a half, we talked about my past and it was actually a lot different. I thought, and, uh, and I had a good feeling after that. And then, um, started to go every week and then had a discussion with what's called the, uh, stake president, which is a higher level uh degree and he didn't even talk about the stuff i'd done he just wanted to know how i was and we just talked about he's actually it was pretty good awesome experience he we just talked about change and uh what's important with belief and following what you know deep down is what we really know what was true and and being true to our beliefs and anyway i came out of it a lot better and the kids did as well. Um, that's when uh, David uh, went to a conference that some of the youth were having and came back like, hey, I want to be part of this. 
And then a year later, he had earned enough money to go on a mission. So his he's got a really incredible story. But um, and since then, you know, um, my kids have been doing flourishing. Um, uh, my oldest daughter, she she was in the middle of this chaos where she, when she graduated, and so you know she she doesn't quite have the same view of it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but uh, and then my son that's in the military, Tyler, he's the one with the girlfriend at the time. He, he, for a while kind of got into it, but he, there's, there's some things that happened when we were being numb nuts that, um, you know, might have to have some group therapy sessions on, uh, in the future, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, the, the, but going back was a good thing. Now, as far as, you know, what I believe now and, and how my belief has changed, I think church is. I think a voluntary thing that we do belief is a voluntary thing that it's, it's a surrender of, well, it's, it's something that you have to decide and it has to be independent of, of how you were raised or what you were taught. And I think actually in a way, my belief now is a lot stronger than in terms of God and there's a purpose to this life. And, um, as far as Mormon theology and doctrine, um, I think Smart. there's, <laughs> I think there's a lot of wiggle room, you know? I mean, I, I know some people are going to cringe when they hear this and uh, I mean, you can cringe all you want. I, one thing with my stake president, when I had this discussion is I said, Hey, some of these things are happened. Some of the stuff is factual. I mean, Yeah. There's an anti-Mormon slant on some of these issues historically, but some of it's <clears throat> some of it's true. And you can't just sugarcoat it. And you can't just walk away from it. And so, and then he asked me, "Well, how, what are you doing about that?" And I said, "I put it on a shelf, basically. I put it on the shelf. And every once in a while, I'll get it down. I'll look at it, and I'll ask a question." is this worth going back to what I was doing before? Or is there something better that I could be doing that I'm not doing now, a different belief or philosophy? And so far the answer has always been no, you know, you're doing fine. That that was my problem is that, that, that shelf was getting too big. (laughs) Well, you you, you see, let's, let's talk about you for a minute. So I think who you're married to is a big deal. and, And, and to go off of what you were saying, Look, the when you read the Bible in the book of Jesus, there oh wait a minute, there there's not a book of Jesus, is there? No, there's not a book of Jesus. <laughs> no, there there's not. No one has um, a, yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, Christian Christianity really is not that different from religion to religion to religion to religion. No. And and, and I've often equated religion to being like music, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know. Some people like country, some people like rap, some people like like heavy metal, some people like jazz, some people like symphony. It's all music. It's the way the music is presented, and the way that that music is presented is how it makes you feel. So Catholicism, Baptist, uh, Methodist, Mormons, it's all about Christ. It's just presented in a different way, and how does it resonate to you? I don't like country music, so I'm not going to listen to music that is presented as country. I love rock and heavy metal. That's what resonates with me, and that's what religion is. It doesn't mean that everybody that listens to country music is wrong and that that's not the true music, and and that's not what it means. And it's the same way with Christianity. The belief that there's only one true church is not a, a valid concept. That's well, not think, what Christ taught. I think you make and, a good, excellent analogy with the music. Believe me, because that's kind of that's a that is a great description of what, how I look at it now. Because you hit it right on the head. Before and with you, you may like jazz, country, yeah. and and rock, and so you're kind of like, well, I, you know what, I, I like it all. I like country a little more, but I also like jazz and hip-hop and you know and there's nothing wrong with that well well there's a scripture i I don't know where it is it it says in my house there's many mansions you know or Mm -hmm. or something like that Mm -hmm. now now there are scriptures that say straight and narrow is the road 
And uh, but I think but straight and narrow is the belief of Christ. Right. I think the problem is people mix up the road with the fact that there's a lot of room available for a lot of different okay. people. So and, and, so what you just said, what, what word music. did you use? What word did you use to your very first word there? What was it? Belief. No, people. Oh, people. Yeah. People. People. There's a giant difference between religion and people. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I Men agree. are not good. We alter things for our own benefit. You know, people talk about, you know, the Catholic Church and they did this and they did that and they did this. The they is the people. It's not the church because the belief of the religion hasn't changed. It's the people that alter. And so your first word there in people, that's what screws religion up. <laughs> well, I think, too, the, the, well, I think the problem, too, is they built you heard the joke, uh, St. Peter is taking this guy through heaven and they're walking down this hall, kind of like a hotel and they pass these rooms and they, they pass one room, the doors wide open and people are playing rock music and, and drinking coffee, having a good time. And he says, who are these guys? Oh, they're the evangelicals. They're they're, they're They have a lot of fun. And then they walk past another door and it's, there's chains on the door. It says, be quiet. Uh, yeah. And, and they're like, well, who's in there? He says, the Mormons, they think they're the only <laughs> ones there. <laughs> so, so I think, I think the problem is uh, when, and maybe this is kind of a cultish belief pattern that uh, I think it's changed though recently in the last, since I got back, I've noticed a major change in LDS. Uh, religion. And to me, that's a problem. <laughs> Well, no, but, I, I don't. I don't. I think it's more inclusive now. I really do. I, I mean, some LGBTQ people don't think so, but I mean, they're crazy to think that any. Well, I mean, I mean, the Mormons have come a long way, long way in twenty years, and and so, um, I mean, is it it's, perfect? It's yet? not the same church that it was before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, and so. To, to get on with what we were talking about with with my journey, and again, yeah, we preface by like this is my journey, right? You know, like sure. what what my thoughts are and beliefs are. I would not try and impose on on anybody else because right. um, that that's not for me to decide. You know, if 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 you were to come to me and say, "Hey, tell me all the bad stuff about Mormons," I'm not going to do that because I don't think that there is bad stuff with 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 the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. I think they're fantastic people, have a fantastic belief. Well, it's just and, not for me. It, it's not along my lines. And so, yes, I, I did marry outside of the church. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is Catholic. Uh, believe it or not, it did not have much to do with, with my belief pattern. Um, if anything, she really encouraged me because as I was questioning things, she kept asking me, are you sure? Are, are you sure you want to go down that path? She, she was wanting to make sure that I was doing the right things and searching in the right areas. And so, you know, my teenage years, I really wasn't in a church at all. It just wasn't for me. I wasn't that kid. I mean, I, I went because I was forced, you know, part of the neighborhood, did all that stuff. Got into my 20s, mid 20s. You know, I I mean, I, I, I was a Mormon, but I wasn't an, an active Mormon at all. When we got married, um, I had I insisted that our kids had to be raised as, as a Mormon. And hmm. and my wife was like, well, you know, you're going to have to do that, <laughs> which means that I would have to get active again. And so when we had our oldest, I got back into the church and eventually went and did, you know, my temple work and did all that stuff and, you know, had callings in the church and we moved out here and yeah, I, I was extremely active. Hey, I got a but, question though. I got a question yes, about the temple uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't get, don't go into any details, but for out of respect, but that first day, that first time you were there, honest opinion, what do you think? It, it was a little overwhelming. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was different. Yeah. 
and and look, yeah. I'm gonna share this and and look if if we want to edit this out, you can edit this one out. But yeah, one of the things that really turned my belief in was, um, you know, when when you go in, you receive your spiritual name. And I, and I was blown away. I'm like, wow, this is this is amazing. This man received my name through prayer. This is who I am. This, this is incredible, you know. And so I continued doing temple work. And and in my head, I was believing. I I thought, as I'm doing this work for all these people, and I'm receiving these names for these people, I'm like, God, this is so incredible. This is so amazing that, you know, you're getting a prayer, you're receiving revelation right here in front of me. This person is this person in heaven. This person is this person. This person is this person. You know, I'm just completely mesmerized and, and like felt, you know, so uplifted. And one day I, I had said to the guy that was doing the temple work, I'm like, this is so amazing that you receive these names for these people every day through revelation. And he says, oh, uh. No. Yeah, every morning um, we have a whiteboard that we write a name down on, and that's the name for the day. Yeah. Jaw-dropping incident there. Yeah. Change of belief. That was probably the first step for me in changing how I felt because now I'm like, wait a minute. you. I was made to believe that. This was brought from revelation in, in each and every prayer, and, and we're all individuals. And now my name was written up on a whiteboard? Are can you I, kidding me? Just for a second, let's talk a little bit about that. And this is a this is a problem I had, too, because I hated the yeah. temple when I first went. I hated it. Just wasn't anything it's, like the experience it's very, I had growing up. And, and it's changed from my understanding, but like right. you were, you know— I mean, well, you know where I'm getting at without well, getting too much detail, yeah. but <laughs> well, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. Okay. So Jesus taught in parables, right? Uh, the book of uh, the Job and uh, the Jonah and the whale. A lot of people disagree that, or a lot of people that study that are, you know, the dude research. wasn't swallowed by a whale. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, a didn't story. it just didn't happen. It was a parable right. parable. Okay. It was a symbol. And I think what I was not taught very well, and I think the church is doing a much better job now, the LDS church. But when I was younger, it was secret. It was sacred, but secret. You can't talk about anything in the temple. And right. and so growing up, I mean, I just, you know, my parents didn't go there very often. And so uh, I went to a temple prep class, but it really didn't give i mean i get to see a picture of the inside or you know what the baptismal font is and blah 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 but oh you take these sacred covenants and what are those oh well you know and 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 i think some of the older generation especially oh they were really into what you were calling that whole oh god talks to us right now you know it's right. this you know this this religious ceremony. oh by the way don't become don't become a mason by the way right well <laughs> exactly well we won't yeah if we want to get into that later uh but that's what I didn't kind of, it didn't gel that this is not symbology, pure symbology. And you've got to think about the story behind the symbology and why it's relevant to your religious experience. I was looking at it as, oh man, you really have to do this to get into heaven? And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and now I look at it and I think a lot of people that have had the current experience that the LDS church does before you go to the temple, which means they go into an explanation of what the symbology is and why they're doing. It. In fact, even the ceremony has now changed from what I understand to giving a better description while you're in the middle of it. And it's less Masonic and more uh, modern. And then uh, you start connecting the dots more. And then now it's like more of a real, a spiritual experience that you can now look in your current life and relate to these things that you're learning about in the temple. So that's what it needed 20 years or 30 years ago. It wasn't there. And, and, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people who have left and like yourself have, have, have that experience. And it's a real experience because I felt the same way. I, I mean, I remember the first week that we have uh, what's called P day where you get a day off. Everybody wanted to go to the Provo temple. I didn't. 
and everybody thought I was some weirdo. And I'm like, I didn't want to have anything to do with that place. And, and so <laughs> the mission, the teacher drags me out of the class before I start really talking about it in front of the other guys. And he's like, what's, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, just didn't like my experience. I said, yeah. you know, some of the clothing freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of the things I had to do kind of freaked me out, you know? And that was back when it was really Masonic. And so anyway, yeah, but it, I'm handing it back to you now. But yeah, I agree with you, man. It, it, it um, yeah, I mean, I think, what where were we at? Yeah, so that that kind of planted yeah. the seed in me. And, and Carl, you've known, you've known me forever. You know, when, when I get something in my head, I'm going to look oh. it up. I'm going to find out about it. I'm going to start to research it. And it, it was interesting because the real turning point actually happened during the election when Mittens Romney was, was yes. running and he was asked some questions about his faith, um, specifically about um, African Americans and 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 with the church, and that again added water to that seed. And it, it, I I remember actually sitting there watching it, and then I just had like a complete change of everything how how I viewed everything. Now it was very frightening, extremely frightening. Um, disconcerting Be yeah. because now i don't know where to go i i did not want to get on the internet and and read a whole bunch of mormon bashing and stuff like that i, I didn't want to go down that avenue because that could easily change you in a complete different direction and and i don't think that i would have found the true answers that i was trying to find so what i actually did was i read mormon books <laughs> Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, um, I read the Joseph Smith journals. I read the um, journals of discourse. Okay, now for those that are in the Mormon Church who probably don't know what the more the journals of discourse are, they were one of the church doctrines up until about 1950. It was part of their scripture, read every day, brought forth in church and everything like that. But because there is a lot of controversial modern day items inside those. The church disbanded those, got rid of them, buried them. They don't even acknowledge them at all. And it was inside these. And, and what those are, are they are their speeches, talks from Mormon leaders themselves. Mm -hmm. And so as I listen to these and I listen to their portrayal of, of Joseph Smith, I, there were a couple things that, that hit me hard. One, that the Mormon church today is different than what Joseph Smith had. And if that was the quote unquote, one true church that he had the vision of and all that, how could this then be that church? It did not make sense to me. A lot of stuff. And so for, for me, a, a religion can't evolve and change and do things and do like, for example, the Catholic church, people are like, well, you know, the Catholic Church changes. No, it hasn't. The, the basic principles and the doctrines of the church of the Catholic Church have not changed ever. The people inside have, but they're, you know, priests don't marry. Their actual doctrine of the church has never, ever changed. And so to me, that was important hmm. that a, a, rich, a religion cannot change because people want it to change. Religion is religion. It's not people are religion. Religion is is people <laughs> see and i won't i won't agree with that statement completely and that's fine it, i do that's know okay. i do know religions change all the time including catholicism historically um there have been changes i mean if you want to say the fundamental beliefs what doctrine have changed. has changed though oh priest priests got married early on in the no, church history yeah they did priest go, look, never, look, priest go back married. go back about 400 bc or ad 500 ad they they certainly did and the, and and the, your current pope is talking, or or, or uh, the pope, right? He's talking mm -hmm. about uh, they. There, there's. I read an article just the other day about them talking about that again as a uh, uh, something that the cardinals wanted to discuss. So, I that's mean, it is to discuss. Well, and, and, I mean, there's and, there's and a difference. Won't. There's a difference between okay. Now now we're getting back again 
to what we talked about right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's a belief in Christ and the fundamental gospel, and then there's religion. And I think a lot of times, and this is a good subject to discuss for a second, I think where people, especially these days, I talk to a lot of people that don't go to church anymore, and it's because they don't believe in religion because they feel that these rules and regulations or this strict box that you have to believe in is, you know, so in other words, if you like vanilla ice cream, you got to be, van everything's got to be vanilla or everything's mm -hmm. got to be cookies and cream. And, and, and I think, yes, that's, that could be something fundamentally wrong with the way they look at their world. But then on the other hand, with religion too, sometimes I think we do create these boxes within religion. I mean, I know the LDS church does. I know there's a lot of this fat, you know, Catholics that leave the Catholic, uh, Catholic church and basically say the same thing, which, you know, yeah. I mean, you can agree or disagree with them, but the point is that's their experience, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, and I don't disagree with that. And so, okay. When when I was when I was reading these these books, my mind's just going insane. And look, mm -hmm. I, I could have you know like you talked about put things on a bookshelf, but yeah. that bookshelf was getting filled with way too many books, and I needed way too many bookshelves. Okay. And so you want to make it simple, yeah, it, exactly. I, I I have to know why. And and I remember talking. I went in and I talked to the bishop because, look, I'll be very honest. It, it's a very frightening time when you begin to understand that the things that you had once believed are not true. And we talked about this a little bit earlier today that some people go in the complete opposite direction. Yeah. I did not want to do that. I, I, for myself mentally, I have to believe that there is something beyond where we are right now. I don't want to believe that we're in the dirt and then we become plant food. And a couple podcasts ago, we discussed uh, with with our, our friend passing away an experience that I had and an experience that Sean had at a complete other area without us talking about it that really, for me, proved that there is something else beyond what we have right here. Sure. And so I, I can't believe in, in, an, in a, a non- how do you say it? I, I, I cannot believe that there is nothing beyond what we are living here right now, because my experience does tell me differently. Of, well, that's, of that. that's part of the problem I have with mainline Protestant Protestantism is this whole hell concept where 95% yeah. of the population is going to be roasting in eternal hellfire where yeah. I don't believe that. Um, no. Now the LDS universalist, uh, to me, that's a man-made way of keeping you in line inside that right. box, you know, well, good, uh, bad, yeah, it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and you so do you do it our and, way and, or and, you're not going to get into heaven. Yeah. Yeah. It, and and so being inside of, of the Mormon church, when you begin to question things, you begin to get labels. It's, it's a very frightening thing. Uh, um. Mm -hmm. You don't know who to talk to. You, you don't know how who to reach out to, who to ask these questions about. Because, again, if I go online, I, I'm going to get answers that are not going to be what I want. And it's going to it's going to steer my thoughts in a different direction. And I, I didn't want that. I, I wasn't looking to leave the church. I wasn't looking for reasons to leave the church. I was just looking for answers. And when oh, I, I mean, received those yeah. answers, to me, it, when I, I remember when I when I finally, I prayed to God, <laughs> I was scared, and and I remember going, I don't know what to do. I'm I'm feeling in darkness. I'm I'm scared. I'm afraid of being abolished. You know, the whole families are forever and everything like that. And yeah. I remember suddenly having a, a sense of of peace and calm. Like Brent, you're okay. Like what you are thinking and feeling is okay, and you're not wrong, and and you're loved for it the way that you feel. And so I I went and I talked to my bishop. You know, it's a very great guy. I I really did like like him, 
and, and I said to him, you know, I expressed my feelings and, and he says, you know what, Brent, the church is a lot like cheese. <laughs> and I stopped him and I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, the Mormon church is like Swiss cheese and there's more holes than there is cheese. <laughs> well, and, and he said, yeah. I remember him saying, and, and, and I thank him for saying this. He said, then maybe it isn't for you. Your, your LDS bishop said mm-hmm. that? He oh, did. wow. Good for him. He, you know. he did say that. And I respect him for saying that and, and understanding how I'm feeling because I think that my overall view and look of the Mormon church would have been very, very ugly if I had continued down that path. And no. so now it's it's a matter of, you know, all right, well, I, you know, I have to find a church and, you know, all that stuff. I realize now you don't have to do that. You really don't. Um, uh-huh. I myself joined the, the Catholic Church because there were a couple things that I need myself inside of religion. I need tradition. There's a lot of tradition inside the Catholic there, Church. There is, and it's, a, and it's a good tradition. My grandfather was Catholic, yeah. It is. I, I need that inside my church. I need, I need to have a central leader, being the Pope and then a priest. You know, a lot of church Baptists don't have that. They have a, a preacher. I went to a, a a Baptist church. It just didn't resonate with me. I just did. It was, it was old school country music to me. <laughs> a lot of twang, and I don't like twang in my music. Um, I went to um, a Lutheran church. I went to a Greek Orthodox church. Um, I didn't really have a desire to go to a Jewish church. Mm -hmm. I just didn't, you know, Um, but, but, and, and Tracy went with me on this too, because I think herself, she wanted to challenge her own faith and, and see these, these other churches and stuff. And so the Catholic church checked off all those boxes that I needed for me, you know, now I've never, ever going to, and I never have Carl told you, Hey, you need to be a Catholic man. You mm-hmm. know? And, and even during your time, when, when you left the church, I didn't try and talk you back into it. And when you went back into the church, I never tried to talk you out of it. My, my well, comment you, was always, that's fantastic, Carl. You know, that's, well, I and, mean, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, you and I, wouldn't talk about beliefs like what we should believe but we did you know if yeah some of the other choices and there's nothing wrong with it and i wish people would do that and understand that because you learn about other people and how they feel by just listening you know Mm -hmm. our our world would be so much better if we didn't take the word of other people towards a group of people and, and and what I'm saying is, I, I tell people, because I get questions all the time about Mormons. I'm like, look, if you want to know something about the Mormon church, ask me, okay? And and I'll tell you, because there's a lot of crap that's out there. There really is. And, and, and unnecessary crap, you know? And, like, if, if you want to know something, ask somebody that's been involved with it. Ask them about it. Don't ask about Joe Schmo, you know, the Baptist preacher or whatever, who knows nothing about it. And has been told it by somebody else who was told about it by somebody else who was told about it by somebody else. That's how we learn and we become better individuals is just asking a question. Don't be afraid and don't get upset and don't try to change the other person's mind about how they feel. And just listen and, and respect for what they believe. In other words, don't and as talk I've to gotten it. older in life, I've finally started to understand that you know (laughs) well and i think that's what you're there's a they teach us in college a lot don't be a black and white thinker the world's gray and so is religion um now god is not gray uh god is either real or he's not Mm -hmm. i mean there's no in between um because it's like the there was a uh, philosopher in france i can't remember his name now uh, you want to go deep on this? You want to go deep? Well, yes, there's the, a God, but but who is God? You know, well, no, we could his, go into a whole other. You well, know. It, it, that, the, well, the <laughs> philosophy, you know, all that—that's where it comes down to. Either, yeah. either God exists or He doesn't, and you're going to find out. There's, there's no. I mean, you know, and this is what some people have asked me. So, 
so you're going to live this life believing in this God, right? I'm like, yeah. And, and they're saying, so you're going to conform and not have as much fun. I'm like, well, how much fun are you really having? And how do you know I don't have fun? How do you how know I that? don't enjoy my I, life? I, I, I... Yeah, yeah, how how does how does what's your idea of fun then? Exactly. I mean, that would be the question. Like, well, do and, I want to go out and, and you know fuck all the bitches? <laughs> yeah. Well, and here's here. Yes. Well, I think that's part of it. But but then it goes down to okay, so I die, and that's it. It's like going to sleep at night. You know, once you're watching a movie and all of a sudden you blank out for an hour and a half, two hours. That's all it's going to yeah. be. What are you scared of? Or there's going to be something. Up. And those people who keep, you know, um, persecuting people who believe in God, then my answer, my question to them is, well, how are you going to feel at that point? I mean, even if even if God is not vindictive, and I don't believe He is, I think you're going to feel kind of stupid. And and to me, feeling eternally stupid and and, and embarrassed for being an idiot, uh, to me, is punishment enough. So if you want to feel that way, that's fine. Continue to mock me and make fun of my beliefs, but. Bottom line is you don't know any more than I do, you know. I mean, so you might think it's chemicals. You you right. you may think those that light that we're going to is a chemical reaction in the brain, but you know what? I've read so many NDEs, Brent, um, near death experience, like you had with Sean. That experience and, and, you have, and my experiences and stuff yeah. affirm that that's not true. And yeah. Dane Cook, uh, you know, a, a comedian, he he's got a, a a great bit that he talks about about how you know, he was talking to this atheist person and the atheist was like, how can you believe in God? You know, there, there's no way. And he's like, well, what do you believe? He says, well, when I die, my body will be buried in the ground. And then eventually my ground will become part of the soil and a beautiful tree will be formed from me, my body that will be in, engulfed into this forest, a beautiful forest. <laughs> Dan Cook says, well, then we're going to come along, chop you down, turn you into paper, and print you as a Bible for everybody else to read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's awesome. Well, you know, and that's why I'm thinking. That's why I've always just a side note on uh, bodies after death. Uh, if we're if we're cremated or put in the ground or made into fertilizer, my dad's my my dad's feeling is he wants to be made. He wants to be cremated and then turned into fertilizer to plant under a tree so a tree will grow bigger. And I'm going to have to tell them that joke now. Then, then they're going to make you, <laughs> then they can cut you down and they're going to make you into a Budweiser advertisement <laughs> and leave you on someone's car. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, this is a fun topic. And I'm sure there's some, I, I, I kind of, I mean, this is the type of uh, discussion that we could have uh, in the future too, and, and dig into this in a little more depth um now one thing um uh i'd like to talk about today too uh is uh, before we end the podcast today is i have an announcement that i i I probably should have brought up at the beginning of the cast but karina she's my sister karina lingren she uh it's her birthday today so happy birthday sis and uh, she's a voc- very active and vocal supporter of Three Dad Bods, by the way. She works as a, uh, I think she's a massage therapist up in Spokane, Washington. And she has wow. three boys. And uh, one of one of the, her boys are, are pretty dynamic. Uh, one in particular, I'd like to get on a podcast. His name is William. And uh, he has um, gone from wanting to transition to um, wanting to take testosterone and be a man. And uh, I'll get into a little more detail with you later, but uh, we might bring him on sometime. And then um, you and I last night came up with a great idea. You want to, well, I, I kind of flesh it out, but kind of give them the overall view of what we're going to start doing on each of our podcasts each week. All right, listeners. So we are going to have a segment called get off my lawn (laughs) and we're each going to share a story that we've heard throughout the last week and we're going to decide if this is like a story that like you know what it's not a big deal move on your way or you know what this deserves a get off my lawn moment so (laughs) 
We're yep. uh, here. We are. Wait a we're, second. We're you kids, a, get off my lawn. And then uh, we're going to have some uh, uh, sound effects. And once the dad bod gives a story out, the other two dad bods are going to judge it. And either you're going to hear a or a. What those two sound effects are, uh, if you can't hear it on this podcast, is either a 12-gauge shotgun going off or a beer being poured for your consumption. (laughs) Now, you can get in on the action as well, because part of this, uh, we wanted to come up with some other ideas the three of us together could talk about. So at the end of each podcast... Uh, you will get an opportunity to also vote on uh, get off your lawn. And so uh, it could be if it is the pour me a cold one uh, option and it wins, you, your subject, that subject might be the next discussion we have on the Three Dad Bods podcast. So anyway, uh, appreciate all our listeners. Uh, Brent, do you have anybody too that you can think of that you want to recognize today? Well, obviously we had Glenn on. That was so great seeing him. Yeah. Um, you know, our our thoughts and prayers are with, you know, I, I I've posted this many times and said this many times, but Glenn in in a world that needs heroes in the worst way, Glenn is right there at the top of my list. Mm-hmm. Um and and we're with you, buddy. We love you. Um thoughts and prayers, you know, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, well, you know, how fantastic, what a positive outlook that, that you have. And, and what an example that, that you set for me each and every day. And, and, um, I'm just, I'm extremely blessed to have somebody like Glenn that I know in my life. It's fantastic. Yeah, we do have, we have a great support structure from our old neighborhood that, uh, and, and great families that, support and love us uh in a way we are privileged and uh so Carl, we, we appreciate y'all yeah um give us your get off the lawn moment here what do you yeah. got yeah uh, um uh, that's a good question uh, do, 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 do. it's okay because i should have <laughs> thought of some what's your what's yours man so did you think you want one? to go with mine yeah oh okay. yeah yeah no i, I've got, okay, I thought it was start yesterday off. buddy Okay, here right. we go. Hey, Brent, I don't. I'm still thinking of it. Go ahead and you give me yours first. All right. So there were a couple of different ways I could have gone. I could have. I, I there were a couple of news stories that I was going to bring up, but then I remembered this last week I had a get off my lawn moment personally. So I'm going to share a personal one with you. Last Sunday, um, let me preface. I I got to tell you, I I've got a beagle. His name is Maximus. And for the first year and a half of his life, he was abused. Um, he was raised in a CBD testing facility. He was beaten. He was, when I saw him in the, at the Humane Society, he was sitting in a corner, tail wrapped up, looking so sad and scared. And to me, the softy that I am, I was like, that's my dog right there. And so we've had him. He's the happiest dog you've ever met, but he's still extremely very skittish. Okay. I give you this background so you understand where I'm coming from with this. So last Sunday, outside doing some work in the backyard, and I go to open the door and my dog goes running out. Okay. Now he's running out. Now I look out and there's a, a gentleman walking up the side road over here. He's got a big stick, a big walking stick, right? And so as I'm, as he's running off, I know my dog is going to go running over to him. And I'm saying, I'm so sorry, sir. Please don't mind him. He's very friendly. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm yelling this as my dog's come. And my dog's tail is wagging. His tongue's out. You know, he just, he just wants to see somebody, right? This guy takes his stick and swings at my dog, right? Oh, I lost it. I went, what the fuck are you doing? Stop. Do not fucking hit my dog. I will beat the fuck out of you right here. My dog goes running off and I'm furious. Why are you swinging at my dog? Again, I told you beforehand, he's harmless. 
his tail's wagging, his tongue's out, and you're swinging at my dog. And he's like, well, he was coming at me. I didn't know what he was doing. I said, look at him. He's doing nothing at you. Wow. And so I, I was in his face. My, I was, I was red. I was seeing red. I'm a very happy guy, but when he pushed me over the edge, I'm sorry. I apologize. I have a very bad temper. So I start walking <laughs> away, and he says, "Well, you, you don't get it. You don't understand." And I turned to him. I said, "What the fuck? Don't I understand?" And I went back up to him and I said, "Go, leave, get out of here." Well. This guy called the police. <laughs> oh, man. I went into work. I had to do some payroll. Tracy calls me and says, hey, the police are here. I was like, what? So the police came and said that I assaulted this man. Uh. And and Tracy's like, well, how would he assault somebody who has a stick? <laughs> oh, and man. so the officers say well can we see this dog right so tracy brings maximus a beagle out and the officer was like this is the dog <laughs> she's like yeah this is cujo you know and so the officer was like oh my goodness you know what i i guess the guy is deathly afraid of dogs and i get that and i feel bad for that but <laughs> that is my get off the lawn moment for this week to open it off with. All right, I hey, I've got to I got to give the old man with the stick a and I got to give you to defending the honor of your dog. Nice cold one. <laughs> and that, folks, is the first get off your lawn story. <laughs> All right, we'll have more. Next week, I'll have mine. Sean will and Brent will. Brent, good job having a story ready to go. And uh, we love you guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Have a great day. Great week, guys. Great week, guys.